All right, please turn your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 20 as we begin our study of God's Word, which is part of growing spiritually, worship God, study His Word, love one another, and reach the lost. And uh, just a reminder on that love one another point, that doesn't just mean love your brethren. It means love everyone, your neighbor, which would include even your enemies. So I just want to remind us of that. It's great to love one another, and we do that in small groups towards us, but we need to love more than just this one another. We need to love every one another that's out there. So we're studying Hezekiah. We've been on Hezekiah for three classes. This is our third class studying Hezekiah. Hezekiah, uh, good king or bad king, y'all? <laughs> Easy question. He was a great king. He, he, was, um, he was a wonderful king. He came in and turned the kingdom back to the Lord when things had gone down uh, really far south with his father. Who was his father? Ahaz. Ahaz. And uh, Brian, you can't answer all the questions now. you got to let other people. <laughs> so Ahaz was his dad. And I mean, he, he, had, he had closed up the temple of the Lord and just turned the nation over to idolatry. And Hezekiah comes in and he reopens the temple and he restores temple worship. He restores the priestly duties. He eliminates the idols in the land, even the high places. We talked about last week that Hezekiah went all in reversing sin for Judah. And, uh, and then on, on Wednesday, um, Brian talked about that the northern, I mean, the kingdom of Assyria came and destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel and almost destroyed the southern kingdom of Judah, came to attack uh, I mean, it was before that that Brian studied uh, Assyria's destruction of Israel. But the next thing that Assyria directed its attention to was Jerusalem and uh, destroyed many cities of Judah, almost destroyed Jerusalem. But God saved Jerusalem by killing how many Assyrian soldiers? 185,000. Brian wrote a really good article I encourage you to read. It's pretty uh, mind-blowing, that number of 185,000. We just read it and go, oh, yeah, that's a lot of people. It's, it's a lot more than you may really, you know, have in your head try to, to try to imagine it. So I encourage you to read that article. So we're kind of picking up uh, sometime around that same time. We don't exactly know when this story happens, but Sennacherib uh, came and invaded Jerusalem in the 14th year of Hezekiah's reign, according to Isaiah 36 and verse 1. And if we do the math there, knowing how old Hezekiah was when he began reigning, he was 25, he was 39 at that time. So I'm 38. He was, he was almost my age, a little over my age. And, you know, at this point, you, you really hope to still have a lot of years of life to go. This is hopefully around my midpoint or less than my midpoint in life. I'm hoping. And you also have this terrible impending, you know, threat of, of Assyrian destruction. If this uh, story happens around this time, Maybe even some say it might have happened before that story of the 185,000 and that it's just uh, recorded here, uh, not in a chronological order. But that, this is a bad time for Hezekiah to, to be sick. But what we're going to learn in our study today of Hezekiah is the right and the wrong response to God's grace. We learn in Hezekiah's example the right response to God's grace, and we also see the wrong response to God's grace. And so we start here by looking at the right response to God's grace in uh, 2 Kings 20, verses 1 through 11. Let's read verses 1 through 3. In those days, Hezekiah was sick and near death, and, and he had a boil. I, I cannot remember where, uh, which account has that, whether it was in Isaiah 38 uh, or where that is. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said to him, Thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you shall die and not live. Then he turned his face toward the wall and prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Okay, so it's down in verse 7 that we learn about the boil. Uh, we learn about that later. So here... Hezekiah receives this bad news and he prays for God's grace. Now, he doesn't specifically say, God grant me life, but it's understood that that's what he's requesting. He's at the brink of death. He's told he's going to die. So he says to God, God, remember how I've lived before you. 
right? And I, I think what he's saying is, God, let me live longer. I think that's very, very clear. And he bases his request on the kind of life that he lived. And I think this is a wonderful example that he could say to God, I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what is good in your sight. He was saying that in total honesty. He knew it was true. He knew God knew it was true. That's a great example for us. Remember what Paul said about his life in 2 Timothy 4 when he was at the brink of death and he knew he didn't have much longer to live. And he told Timothy, I have, remember, fought the good fight. I've finished course. I've kept the faith. He knew that was true. He knew God knew that was true. And what a wonderful thing for us to be able to say to God. God, you know I have lived that way before you. It's not saying I'm perfect. Hezekiah wasn't perfect. He knew he wasn't perfect. Paul wasn't perfect. Paul knew he wasn't perfect. But it is a statement that, God, you know I've committed my life to you. And I have served you. So we need to be able to say that honestly. However, it's a tricky balance, isn't it? Because remember the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector praying at the temple. And remember what the Pharisee said, God, thank you that I'm not like other wicked people, like you know, all these different people, including this publican right here. I mean, I fast twice a week and give tithes of all that I possess. Total arrogance, a, a, a mindset of salvation by works. So we need to make sure we're not going down that path, but we do need to be able to say what Hezekiah said. Well, then Hezekiah receives some good news. Starting at verse 4, and it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court, so he's leaving, that the word of the Lord came to him saying, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Surely I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up to the house of the Lord. I didn't really do any research here, but there, there just seems the very strong possibility of some foreshadowing of Jesus being raised on the third day. And verse 6, And I will add to your days 15 years. I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. So this wasn't all about Hezekiah. This was in light of God's uh, prophecy to David and his commitment to David's line. So here God granted Hezekiah's request. His understood request was grant to, for God to give him life. And so God gave him 15 more years. Imagine that. Now still, he's not going to be a really old man by the time he dies. Right? Imagine you're 39 and you're told you've got 15 years to live. That'd be good news, but still you're not going to live a very long life. But nevertheless, that's a, a tremendous blessing to, to be told that. But God gave even more than He requested. What else did God say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do? I'm going to deliver you from, from your enemy. That's another reason why some people put this chronologically before that story of the 185,000, that that was God's deliverance. We understand things in a linear, linear kind of way, and that's how we write and everything, but the Bible isn't always grouped that way and organized that way. So it's, it's possible, and I'll give you some other reasons why this might have happened before that, that story in a little bit. But God gave Hezekiah both life and deliverance from his enemy. Brief application. In Christ Jesus, God gave us both life and deliverance from our enemy. God lavished His grace on Hezekiah. He didn't just give him enough just to get by. He gave him what he asked for and even more. And, of course, God in Christ Jesus has lavished His grace on us. I talked in my Lord's Supper talk about Ephesians 1 and 2. In Ephesians chapter 1... It says, in Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished. I love that. Which He lavished on us. Uh, Stone misunderstands the word lavish. If he's really hungry, he says, I'm lavishing. <laughs> I say, Stone, that's not what that, that means. So here, just the idea. God just poured His grace upon us in, in Christ Jesus uh, to do even more than we have asked, even more than we can even think to ask. 
Well, let's pause our narrative here. I want to talk about something that should build your faith. And this is Hezekiah's seal. This was discovered in 2015 at the foot of the southern wall of Jerusalem. It's a one centimeter bulla. A bulla is a, a, a lump of clay that would, would be used to seal things. And, and this was uh, stamped with Hezekiah's signet ring. It's, it actually says on it, belonging to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. That's pretty cool. If you will pardon my slang. <laughs> That's, it's, pretty, it's pretty neat. Uh, on, the, on the reverse side of this bullet, I read that you, you could see two uh, chord Im impressions because this bulla was used to seal uh, some kind of document, uh, a scroll that was bound with cords. And so there are many uh, bulla, or I don't know what the plural of, of bulla is, if it's bullae, I think it might be, but many of these seal impressions of Hezekiah that have been discovered. And his symbol changed over time. There was an evolution of his symbol. It originally was the dung beetle, which in the ancient Near East was just a well-known symbol of power. But over time it evolved, and this is kind of uh, the, the third iteration of it. And in the middle there is a sun with rays shining downward. And these are two wings outspread downward. I think of what Isaiah said about flying with wings of an eagle, like wings of an eagle. On either side of the wings is a symbol of life. Here, and there's one over here you cannot see. And you see the, ring, the, the edge of the ring. See that? Pretty, it's just pretty neat. Uh, it has been suggested, and we can't prove this, that the reason for this, the evolution of the symbol itself and the reason that you have in this uh, particular seal, which they believe was later in Hezekiah's reign, uh, the reason perhaps that we have the symbol of life that's on there twice might be because God granted to Hezekiah life. Fifteen more years of life. We can't prove that. But if that was true, it sure would be neat. So I just wanted to suggest it to you. Either way, I, I wanted this to help to encourage you to know, of course, th these are real people, real places, real stories. This is not a fairy tale book. And th these kind of things help to increase my faith, and I hope it increases yours too. So let's, uh, let's move forward here just a little bit to talk about Hezekiah's sign. I, I actually will pause here first. Does, does anybody have any questions or comments at this point? Mr. David? Do we know what time it was, what, what year it was? Well, it's difficult. Uh, we know what, what year it was when Sennacherib came uh, and tried to destroy Jerusalem. I believe that was 701. Isn't that right? But since we don't know uh, when this story happened, if it happened before that or after that, we can't say exactly when. But my guess would be right around that time, 701. I think it probably happened before that story. The stamp, is it, uh, what's it made of? Is that brass or? It, it's clay that is dry. <clears throat> and in many cases, these, these seals have been burned with fire because Jerusalem was destroyed with fire, <laughs> causing them to harden as hard as a rock. And so there are just oodles of them that have been discovered. Yeah. Uh, oh. We could talk about um, Jeremiah's scribe. Can't remember his name, but um, there, there is a seal that has his name on it, Baruch. Baruch. When we get into Jeremiah, uh, maybe we'll get a chance to talk about that, but it's pretty neat. Brian? Yeah, I see a neat parallel, this idea of God saving Hezekiah for the sake of David, the servant. You know, yeah. It's the same way with us in that, okay, we... We can have faith like Hezekiah did, but we're not going to be perfect, and we're not we're not going to be righteous to the point of earning grace. But for the sake of the Son of David, right. for the sake of Jesus, Amen. God gives us grace <coughs> despite our imperfection. That's that's a great comment. Now we'll we'll move forward here. I've got some other things that are going to uh, I think build your faith as we move forward here in in chapter twenty. Let's uh, start reading 
in verse 7 as we learn about Hezekiah's sign. Then Isaiah said, Take a lump of figs. So they took it and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. And Hezekiah said to Isaiah, What is the sign that the Lord will heal me, and that I shall go up to the house of the Lord the third day? Then Isaiah said, This is the sign to you from the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing which He has spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten degrees or go backward ten degrees? He had a choice. And Hezekiah answered, It is an easy thing for the shadow to go down ten degrees, but no, let the shadow go back ten degrees. Now, I think we're talking here about a sundial, although some versions render it differently. I'll talk about that in a second. But the shadow going forward or backward would be uh, a way of telling time. And uh, he, he says it, it wouldn't be a big deal for the shadow to move forward. Now, that doesn't actually mean that if, that if God instantly made the shadow go forward 10 degrees, that it wouldn't be a miracle and it wouldn't be amazing. It would be. But comparatively speaking, moving forward to moving backward, well, moving backward would be even more impressive. That's, that's his point. So he says, make it move backward. So 11, uh, verse 11, so Isaiah the prophet cried out to the Lord, and he brought the shadow ten degrees backward by which it had gone down on the sundial of Ahaz. Now I'm reading the new King James today. Normally I have the New American Standard, but I left my Bible in the pulpit, couldn't find it all week, grabbed my spare Bible, which is the new King James. So that's why I'm reading it. But it turns out to, uh, to be nice for this particular story because it renders it sundial. Does anybody have a different version that reads something different? Stairway. Stairway. So stairway? Yeah. Steps of the temple. Steps. Okay. So the Hebrew terminology is a little uncertain. And it kind of just means ascending. And so um, normally that would be steps, right? So it's hard to know exactly how to translate it. If this was steps that is being talked about here, that it was still some way of telling time, right? A, cato, a shadow being cast uh, by these steps. But... Uh, sundial seems to make more sense with that because that was done. It was done by Babylon and perhaps adapted uh, by, by Ahaz, Hezekiah's father. So if it was a sundial, here's a picture of a sundial, and they divided their days into 12 parts. Just like we have 12 hours in a day, and so there are actually 12, whoops, there are actually 12 sections. Each one of these is a section. And there's supposed to be a rod protruding out here that's broken. Uh, this particular uh, sundial goes back to the first century B.C., not quite as far back as Hezekiah's day, but still very old. Now, here's a much newer one that is a Greek one, and here you can very clearly see the rod and see the shadow casting the time, right? And so for the shadow to move backward 10 degrees, I think would basically be the equivalent of like 10 hours, okay? And uh, I don't know how God did that. Maybe, and some suggest, he just reversed the cosmos just enough to make that adjustment. Could God do that? <laughs> of course God could do that. He created everything out of nothing with words. He could do that. I don't know if that's how he did it. We need to be careful of, of saying that's how he did it. Some suggest that it was an eclipse that God caused. Um, of course, could God make the shadow go back 10 degrees without doing anything in the heavens? Well, he's God. So we don't know how. It doesn't matter, but the point is it's miraculous and that was a sign to Hezekiah that he would indeed be healed. Uh, by the way, the sign of God's grace for us is much greater than a shadow going back 10 degrees. What is, what is that sign for us? It is Christ's resurrection from the dead. So as the narrative continues, Hezekiah offers a beautiful prayer. It's not recorded in 2 Kings here. It's in Isaiah 38. And I'm not going to actually read that whole prayer, but... In that prayer, he tells God, uh, I, I thought I was dying. I thought you were killing me. And I looked to you. I was terrified. And you saved me. He says in Isaiah 38, 17, Lo, for my own welfare I had great bitterness. It is you who has kept my soul from the pit of nothingness. For you have cast all my sins behind your back. I remember when we were in the last chapter of Micah. Remember what Micah said about our sins? Remember what he said? Sir? Yes, sir. You have cast all of our sins into the depth of the sea. They're gone. 
never to be retrieved again. Hezekiah says, you've cast my sins behind your back. It seems that Hezekiah, it doesn't seem, but Hezekiah did connect his healing with the forgiving of his sins. Perhaps there was some sin that was causing God's judgment on him to cause his death. In Hezekiah's mind, that seems to be what was going on. We don't know what sin that would be. Hezekiah wasn't perfect. Do you remember that he gave great amounts of silver and gold to the king of Assyria? Even uh, giving his daughters. Remember that? That was a sin. Maybe that's what was in Hezekiah's mind here. You have cast all my sins behind your back. We don't know. But either way, he wasn't, he wasn't sinless regardless. But what a beautiful thing for us to say to God. You've cast my sins behind your back. They're, they're gone. We can take confidence in that through our Lord Jesus Christ. As Hezekiah's prayer ends, he essentially says, I'm going to devote my life to you. You saved me. You gave me 15 more years. I'm not going to waste them. They're going to be spent in devotion to you. That's the right response to God's grace. God has saved us. He has given us life. As I said in my talk earlier, not just when we were at the brink of death, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. God, through Jesus, has given us life. The proper response is humility, gratitude, and a commitment of ourselves to the Lord. You saved me, so I'm going to give myself fully to you in the time that I have remaining. I've wasted enough time in the past, right? I've I've blown enough opportunities back there. So now I'm just going to be extra dedicated to you. It seems to be the motive that he has here because he loves God so much. That's the right response. Brian is going to talk in his sermon about the fact that grace is God's power to take you to a new and higher place. Grace takes you to a higher place. That's that's God's intention with grace. We need to allow it to take us to a higher place. Not to a lower place as we're about to look at unfortunately. So I'll pause here and see if we have any questions or comments. Terry? When it comes to miracles, it's funny because you know, I always think of, oh, this miracle is, is, is greater than another one. But with God, you know, it just dawned on me, turning water to wine or you know, water from a rock, it, he could have created a second sun, he could have made it a little flat. Like to him, it's nothing. It's nothing. We're all the same. You know? and, um, and the only miracle that I can think of that is so different from any other ones is him sending his son from heaven down onto earth and letting him die and take on the our sins. And it's done that way. All yeah. miracles the same. Okay. Oh, yeah. And that one far surpasses. His resurrection of the dead uh, far surpasses all the others. Great point. Matt? Um, just another example. And we talked about it you know, here where he says, cast it to my back. And then the first part was lavishing him. Just another reminder that God wants to forgive us. We don't let him, if we, if we don't cast this in his back. It's not left it. He really, really wants. Yeah. He's excited. <laughs> yeah, I, my heart just breaks for people who cannot forgive themselves. When I'm, for, I'm convinced when I talk to these individuals that I'm thinking of that have the right heart and that are seeking God, that God has forgiven them. But they, you know, the, the hardest one to get forgiveness from is yourself. And, and, and Satan loves that. And he, he will use that against you and it will prevent you from becoming what you should become for God because you can't forgive yourself. So you're paralyzed. And uh, it's a trap. Satan's trap, as Brian talked about in one of his recent classes. All right, well, let's move forward now and talk about the wrong response to God's grace. And we, we look here at Hezekiah's pride. So let's read about the gifts from Babylon in verses 12 and 13. At that time, Baradoc Baladan, some versions say Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that Hezekiah had been sick. Well, that was nice. And Hezekiah was attentive to them and showed them all the gold, all the house of his treasures, the silver and gold, the spices and precious ointment, and all his armory, all that was found among his treasures. There was nothing in his house or in all his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. All right, we need to unpack this here. First of all, Merodach or Baradach Baladan, you can look him up on Wikipedia. There's actually a a lot that is known about him in the annals of history. Uh, He, this is a picture of a relief of Merodach Baladan on the left. Uh, 
and, and he's basically making a legal contract with a vassal uh, king here, and uh, that really plays well into what I'm about to tell you. Merodach Baladan began his reign in 722, the very year that the northern kingdom of Israel was destroyed by Assyria, and he rebelled against Assyria. Don't you know Assyria wanted Babylon under its control? And he, and of course, they, they did have Babylon under their control, but Merodach Baladan did everything he could to resist that. And as his story continues, uh, and I believe this will be after this particular story we're reading in, in uh, 2 Kings, as his story continues, he rebels against uh, Assyria, and Sargon, uh, king of Assyria, actually runs him out, and he, he, has, he has to leave Babylon for a time. He comes back in power and reinstigates a rebellion against Assyria and ends up getting defeated, though he lives, he spends the rest of his life as a fugitive. So that kind of defines who this man was and what he was about. He was under the constant threat of the world power until Babylon eventually became the world power, right? Which was after his time. But at this time, they weren't the world power. But don't you know he wanted allies? Don't you know he would have heard about what, what happened with those 185,000 Assyrians? That, oh, the king of Judah is resisting. And look at what happened. I want that guy to be my friend. I want his God to be on my side. That's why he sends this gift. Hezekiah knew that. He wasn't stupid. He knew what's going on here is this king wants to, to be an ally. He wants me to be an ally uh, with, with him. And he receives these men. Now, there's another verse that sheds some light here that's pretty fascinating. And if you want, you can turn. We'll be in 2 Chronicles some. I'm just going to show a couple of passages up on the screen, though. In 2 Chronicles 32... In verse 31, it says, Even in the matter of the envoys of the rulers of Babylon, who sent to him to inquire of the wonder that had happened in the land, God left him alone only to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. God was going to test him. There's a lesson there. But I want to focus on that. It says the, these messengers were sent to inquire of the wonder that had happened in the land. There's two possibilities I can think of of what that wonder might be. What do you think it might be? 185, the 185,000. Would that be a wonder in a land? Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Brian names in his article, like I think it's like eight cities, including Altamont Springs and the surrounding cities, that finally get to the number of 185,000. It might have been 10 cities. I can't remember what it was. I didn't count them. But it was, I was just like, wow, you've got to be kidding me. It's a huge number. And these were soldiers. So that might be what this was about. Seems to be fitting to the context. But what other, what other thing might the wonder in the land be? The sun going down. It might have been if God did do something in the heavens to cause that shadow to go back 10 degrees. Well, Babylon is uh, very well known for their astronomy. They would have noticed that. Everybody would have noticed it. But it might be that that's the wonder in the land. I don't think that that would fit the context as much, but it's possible. Either way, that, that's, that gives an extra... An, an ulterior motive besides just, oh, we want to send him gifts because he was sick. They wanted to find out what was going on, and they wanted to be allies. So he makes a major mistake. Hezekiah makes a major mistake by showing them everything, welcoming them and just showing off everything. He is full of pride, and it was a needless mistake. He didn't need Babylon. He didn't need their help. He did not need the approval of the king of Babylon or these messengers, but oh, that really filled him with pride. This was pride after the grace of God that was shown to him. In fact, in 2 Chronicles 32, here's another couple of verses. Verse 24, In those days Hezekiah became mortally ill, and he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord spoke to him and gave him a sign. So the chronicler doesn't go into the detail that, that uh, Kings goes into. But then in verse 25, but Hezekiah gave no return for the benefit he received because his heart was proud. Therefore, wrath came on him and on Judah and Jerusalem. He gave no return. He had told the Lord in that prayer in Isaiah 38, I'm going to give you, I'm just going to commit myself to you because you have given me life. But he gave no return. Instead, he turned his back on the Lord, at least for this instant, instance where, where he was filled with pride with these Babylonian messengers. 
This is the wrong response to the grace of God. I'm just going to blank the slide out for a minute. So we have received this amazing grace giving us life. The wrong response is pride. A pride that says, I guess I can get away with anything. I can get away with murder. Don't people treat God's grace that way? Didn't Paul have to warn uh, the brethren at Rome in, in Romans 6 and verse 1? What shall we say? Uh, shall we continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be, he says. So people abuse God's grace all the time. Well, guys, I've got a grace, so I, you know, I can sin and I can go on and do this and that. That is a heart of pride. It is exploiting the grace of God. That's not what God's grace is for. It should take us to a new and higher place, not to a lower place. And I wrote an article, I encourage you to read it today in the bulletin, uh, Four Ways Christians Abuse God's Grace. And uh, I could have wrote it, it could have been 444, but that would have been a novel. That would have been a long, a long article. So that's the wrong response. We've got to beware of making the same mistake as Hezekiah. Yeah. Who said my name? Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, what does it mean that the Lord left him alone? In the, in the matter of those, those envoys, those messengers who came, it was like God was saying, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to see how you react to this. And I think of it like when David was on the top of his house and his army was out fighting a battle, God was testing him, and he failed that one with Bathsheba. So God will test us. He will, as it were, leave us alone to see what we're going to do. So let's not fail the test. Terry? Um, I don't know if this is what he was thinking or not, but the Lord said that he would save him from his enemies. So, you know, maybe he saw this as the means by which God was doing that. Uh, but I think, and it's sometimes we're praying for something and we want it to happen, we see a way that that can happen. And I think the important thing is to, to check our own motives and see if we're prideful and see if we're making it fit what we want um, rather than trusting in God. Does that make sense? Sometimes uh, we're really good at finding loopholes because we're looking for them. God's Word is not intended to be a book of loopholes. His grace is not intended to be used as a loophole. Um, and yeah, uh, what's in our heart? What are we looking for? What is our intention? And it comes down to either humility or pride. Yeah, that's a great comment. So, as we continue here in verse 14, then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah. Now, I, I just, this is really awkward because Hezekiah always was encouraged by Isaiah. Isaiah was the one that would come to him and give him strength and, and, and messages of hope and deliverance. But listen to this. Uh, what do these men say? And from where did they come to you? So Hezekiah said, they came from a far country, from Babylon. And he said, what have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, they have seen all that is in my house. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Hard thing about understanding conversations in the Bible is we don't know the body language, the tone. I have always read this in the context of his pride to be a statement of, well, yeah, that's what I did. And if I could go back, I'd do it again, Isaiah. You got a problem with it? Is that the character of Hezekiah? Now, of course, I know the previous story was out of his character. I know that, okay? But I just get the feeling that that wasn't his attitude here. And I want to show you, uh, if I have time, a verse that leads me to think that Hezekiah was actually, at this point even, filled with humility. That he knew what he had done was wrong. There seems to me to have been some time to pass between verses 13 and verse 14. I'm not going to be dogmatic about that but I'll show you why I have come to that conclusion. So it seems to me that he's just honestly saying, this is what I did. He's not trying to hide it. He's not proud of it. 
But he's not going to lie. What good would it do to lie to Isaiah, who had the Holy Spirit, right? He's going to tell him. Verse 16, Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Whew. That would not be a fun message to receive. The fulfillment of this uh, passage of his descendants going into Babylon would not be fulfilled in his direct son, but in his descendants. Uh, Daniel 1 and verse 3 mentions that uh, when Nebuchadnezzar came and took certain of the young, smart people, right? Those like Daniel and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, or as we call them, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those were the descendants of Hezekiah. That's the fulfillment of this. Uh, that portion of, of the prophecy is fulfilled in that. And as harsh as this is, there is still some mercy in this prophecy. In, in what way? It wasn't happening in Hezekiah's time. God said it will happen in the days of your descendants. Now, 2 Chronicles 32, 26 says, However, Hezekiah humbled the pride of his heart. This is after the story of the, the, the Babylonian messengers. He humbled the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come on them in the days of Hezekiah. Do you see that that's a direct connection with 2 Kings 20 and verse 19 and the corresponding verse in uh, Isaiah 39? Will there not be peace and truth at least in my days? And so according to the chronicler, by the time Hezekiah was given the prophecy here, Hezekiah's heart had already been humbled. The fact that it was humbled meant that the message that the prophecy was not more harsh than it was. It could have been, God's going to judge you right now. And He's going he's to destroy you while you're still alive and everything will be taken out. Uh, uh, everything will be taken away into Babylon and all of that. But it was put off. And I think that is because, according to this verse, of the fact that Hezekiah humbled his heart. Now, when did he humble his heart? I mean, we didn't read about that here in 2 Kings. We have at the end of verse 13, the story of the messengers, and then verse 14, Isaiah comes to him and rebukes him. But apparently there was some time between there, and Hezekiah humbled his heart, as well as the inhabitants of Jerusalem humbled their heart. What caused them to humble their heart? Do you all know? I don't think anybody knows. But I have a suggestion. Jeremiah 26. All right, now don't read it. Jeremiah prophesied a message of condemnation. We're going to talk about Jeremiah soon. He was telling the inhabitants of Jerusalem, listen, the king of Babylon is going to take you. You better just submit. And in Jerusalem and the temple, it's all going to be destroyed. Right? They hated him for that. The priests and the prophets, what did they want to do to him? They wanted to kill him. And the, the leaders, at least at this time, were wise enough to say, Stop, don't kill Jeremiah. And they said this, Micah of Morasheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah. And he spoke to all the people of Judah, saying, Thus the Lord of hosts has said, Zion will be plowed as a field, and Jerusalem will become ruins, and the mountain of the house as the high places of a forest. So he's saying, Micah, now who was Micah a contemporary of? What prophet? I, Isaiah. And so Micah, Isaiah, they're right there together in, in their lives, in their career. Uh, although Micah's career didn't seem to be as long as that of Isaiah's. But Micah prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. All right? Now look at what the leaders go on to say in verse 19. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah put him to death? Did he not fear the Lord and entreat the favor of the Lord? And the Lord changed his mind about the misfortune which he had pronounced against them. 
but we are committing a great evil against ourselves. You see what they're saying? They're saying, you want to kill Jeremiah because he prophesied against Jerusalem? Is that how Hezekiah responded to Micah when Micah had a similar prophecy? Hezekiah didn't kill Micah. What did Hezekiah do? He repented. He humbled his heart. And so God did not bring that judgment during his day. It's very possible that Jeremiah 26, 19 fits between 2 Kings 20, 13 and 14. That that very well might be the humbling of Hezekiah's heart that 2 Chronicles 32, 26 talks about. I hope that didn't thoroughly confuse you. So let me kind of map that out for you, if that's the case. So you had the Babylonian messengers come. You, you have Hezekiah's response of pride in welcoming them. He's filled with pride. God is not happy. Micah 3.12 is the prophecy that Jeremiah refers to there where Micah comes and he prophesies in the day of Hezekiah, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. But Hezekiah humbled his heart. The inhabitants of Jerusalem humbled their heart. And therefore, when Isaiah comes to rebuke Hezekiah of his pride with the Babylonian messengers, his heart was already humbled. And the message, message the prophecy was not as harsh as it would have been if he hadn't humbled his heart. That's a possible scenario. I'm not saying I know that for sure. I think it's probably the case. But I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be dogmatic about that. But it seems to fit to me. We then read of Hezekiah's death. Verses 20 and 21. Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah, all his might, and how he made a pool and a tunnel and brought water into the city, which Brian talked about and showed us pictures about, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? So Hezekiah rested with his fathers, then Manasseh. Oh, I almost just hear that music, you know, that doom kind of music. Manasseh, his son, reigned in his place. Bad news. Ahaz, good king. Hez, I mean, bad king. Hezekiah, great king. Manasseh, perhaps even worse than Ahaz was. It's really, really bad. So I want to end with this question and then uh, open up to any discussion. How do you respond to God's grace? Do we respond like Hezekiah on that second part of our lesson today with pride, thinking I can, I can get away with anything because God loves me. He's a God of grace. I can do anything. Or do we respond with humility and a commitment to let God's grace take us to a new and higher place? I can't answer that question for you. I just want it to be something for you to think about. I'm going to end there. Uh, we have two minutes. Uh, does anybody have any comments? Starting with anybody who hasn't made any comments, do you have anything you want to mention or ask? All right, anybody? Anybody who's said anything before or not? Jack? Adam, it's a, it's a very difficult thing to know the providence of God from, uh, and, and His grace from just simply time and chance. Time and chance does happen to us all. I've had a number of times where um, I look at it and I say that may have been God preserving me, and it may very well have been just by yeah. uh, dumb luck. Yeah, like Mordecai in the book of Esther. Right. Who knows? Maybe God has brought us to the kingdom for such a time as this. Yeah, we can't always know. But don't assign, you know, providence to something that could be, you know, Ecclesiastes 9-11, time and chance, happened to them all. Be careful about assigning something with uh, total confidence that you, you, you can't know because we're not a prophet. In particular, about yourself, because that can be seen as bragging. God is here so That's much true. for me, he saves me. <clears throat> Any other comments, questions? I just think it's super cool. Reading the Bible is awesome, but when you Bible study, and you get to pull in all these verses together and make a, a bigger picture of it and get this, oh man, what God brings is awesome. It's fun. It's, it's fun. The study of God's Word. It is super cool, as you say. Yeah. And awesome. Yeah. I would, I would agree. All right. 20 seconds. Brian. <laughs> um, I, I love how God is, he's just a God of reversal. You know, yeah. he, he reverses the time on the sundial or the stairs, you know, and it's symbolic of reversing the sentence of death on Hezekiah and 
you know, he reverses. Right? He makes things as if they never happened. You know, he, he raises Jesus from the dead, reverses his death. It's like he, it's like it never happened. You know, he's he's victorious over death now. And he can do the same thing for us. No matter how bad we've been in the past, he's a God of reversal, and he can make us clean and new. Amen. Great, great closing thought. Please read through page uh, 138A for uh, Wednesday, and thank you for your attention.